Hello and welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr, where we talk about the art and culture of running an indie record label. So excited to uh, share with this, uh, share with you this episode today. It's another one in our series called Industry Insiders, where I take a break from interviewing record labels and focus on finding people in the industry who serve the uh, DIY artist and indie artist and indie record label community and get a chance to talk with them about how we can better use their services, um, how can they serve us better, blah, blah, blah. Today, I'm chatting with CD Baby and Kevin at CD Baby, who has been there for a long time, and he's uh, the head of marketing, and he also runs a great podcast called The DIY Musician, which is probably the biggest indie music, or, or I should say, indie uh, musician uh, business podcast out there. Uh, incredible resources from their show, and they've been going on for so many years, and I've been a, a fan of that podcast for so long. If you are in the early stages of starting your label or if you're a DIY artist and you're looking how to get your music on CD Baby or Spotify, uh, et cetera, uh, this is the episode for you because we're going to talk a lot about that process. And if you are in the early stages of your label, please go to our website, otherrecordlabels.com. I'm in the process of adding more resources, but right now we have a great resource uh, called our free guide for indie record labels where... We take a lot of the wisdom and information over the past couple of years from this show and put it into a free guide where you can download that. And you can get that at otherrecordlabels.com. Before we get into the interview, I want to mention, listen, this is not a sponsored episode. This is, of course, there are lots of different distributors out there, but I've worked with CD Baby for years. I can't even remember why I chose them to be my digital distributor for my label and for my own music personally. It probably was the only option at the time. I can't remember. It was it was well over 10 years ago. I mean, it was probably even more than 15 years ago. Um, but I, and I think it maybe even started with distributing CDs with them. But I just wanted to mention, this is not a, a paid advertisement. I really, uh, I personally, so far, thus far, uh, endorse these guys because I've worked with them for so long. They've been very helpful for me. Um, and they have some great services for labels um, that hopefully you'll get a chance to learn about. And uh, I've just been, a, I've been a fan of this, of this group. And, uh, and they have been really helpful for me as an artist and for my label over the past couple of years. And so I'm excited to chat with Kevin. Let me, let's talk about CD Baby. I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm such a fan. But listen, uh, right out of the gate, I mean, the first question that any DIY artist or indie label asks when prepping to release an album, and, and you see this in Google and on YouTube, the number one question is CD Baby, TuneCore, or DistroKid? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that is the... That just comes up. People have asked me that question. Friends who are mm-hmm. releasing music, they ask me that question. Now, before I let you give me your completely unbiased opinion, I want to say, first off, that for me, my label with other songs, I've been doing CD distro and digital distro with CD Baby all the way back to 2007. Um, so I'm biased myself, and there's a <laughs> lot of reasons why, and, and, and we'll get into that. But the truth is that this fork in the road is something that every self-releasing artist and label come to when when releasing a, a record or single. So so please guide us. Uh, well, I haven't heard of those other two companies. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, well, we're better, of course. Um, I, I'll give you a number of reasons why. Well, first off, you mentioned physical. We still do physical distribution, which for some artists is still a, a big uh, revenue opportunity. Right, right. Um, it's changed over the years. Uh, most of our physical distribution comes through our partnership with Amazon and mm. Alliance uh, now these days. Um, but really, for us, here's the main difference. Um, the easiest way to, to make decisions about your music career uh, or to some extent. But here's one thing. We take 9%. And that's one thing those other companies will say, oh, they've taken your money. Yeah. But we have skin in the game. We right. want your music to succeed. We right. want to make sure it's fully monetized. Mm. We want to make sure that it's in all the stores possible. And we don't charge you to do that because uh, we make money too. So for us, getting the best deal for the artist 
mm-hmm. is very important. I, the hard thing is, you know, being the VP of marketing, I absolutely wish I was able to tell you our payout rates compared to some of those folks that say they don't take any money. Yeah. Because we go to bat and spend money on lawyers to make sure you make more money because we make more money. Right. Right. <laughs> and and just making sure that our catalog is everywhere it needs to be and that the artists are getting the best deal possible. Mm. Sometimes that means it looks like we're not the first to a market. Uh, that's because in the background, there's a lot of negotiation going on because we have the power to do that, where other companies just take the standard deal and, uh, and you know, make a big deal about being first. But that just means that they didn't negotiate a better rate on behalf of their users because they don't care. They don't make any more money. It's not worth them I see. Uh, yeah. spending the time and energy to do that. So there's other things like that behind the scenes that the artists don't see. And because of the way these contracts are written, we're not allowed to publicly say certain things that like makes that. Sense. Um, yeah. So the other thing is like, we have a full-time crew uh, pitching for placement in film and TV, which we've been getting lots of placements um, in shows, movies, mm-hmm. and all sorts of stuff that if we didn't make any money off of, you know, if we didn't have a piece of the action, it wouldn't make sense for us to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, uh, that's you know, a good point. That's, that's what we're doing for artists. And again, the way I was thinking about it recently was um, if you're an artist and you're looking for a manager and somebody says, I'll manage you and I'm going to do it for free, that manager, even if they have the best intentions from the beginning or have maybe some nefarious intentions down the road, (laughs) they're going to be pretty unreliable because when it gets hard and you need them to go to bat for you, they're going to be like, well, man, hey, I'm not getting paid for this. What are you asking me for? Sure. Uh, And so you're like, well, man, you said you'd work for me. Well, you're not paying me. Um, Yeah, yeah. So for us... For us, we are constantly going to bat for artists and negotiating, and especially with some of our, uh, we are part of the Downtown Music Holdings family, which our sister company is Song Trust and Downtown Music Publishing, which actually gives us a lot of power to negotiate on behalf of independent creators. Right. And, right. Um, and so, yeah, you want that power behind you, and it doesn't happen for free. Yeah. Um, no, I totally get that. I mean, that's actually something I've been aware of the the percentage point and, and uh, that's something I hadn't thought of, but I totally, totally agree. And, and, and you see it with, um, you see it as well with, with uh, music supervisors who will take a cut of your song, but you want them to be pushing your song. And um, yeah, I think that's a, a great thing. Some of the, the models of, of some of the other companies that I think, are are maybe more appealing it for short term thinking. You might be looking at it and going, I only have to spend this much right now, uh, or I'm you know nobody's going to take anything from my new release. But one of the things that bothers me, and and I think there's a lot of great options out there, and um, but one of the things that bothers me is I I personally don't like the idea of music potentially disappearing. Uh, if an artist's annual streaming revenue isn't enough to cover their annual membership. I, I think that's like a disservice to fans. Uh, and so CD Baby's model is like, once you pay for the music, it's up there for eternity. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's my big sticking point with all the other models is that it is cow- counterintuitive to the way artists should be thinking to build a long-term successful career. Hmm. And by that, I mean, like you said, short-term thinking, most music success does not happen with short-term thinking yeah. or a short-term decision. Right. What happens is you most artist success happens by building a catalog over time that gets bigger and b- bigger. And as you build more fans, they you have more entry points into the music. You have... Uh, you know, maybe you get better as an artist, hopefully. Mm, mm-hmm. And the more you release music, the more that you're connecting with new fans and they go back and listen to everything. Absolutely. And now instead of having one new song that that fan is only going to listen to so many times, you now have a hundred songs 
that they yeah. can go listen to a whole catalog for uh you know a lot and yeah. uh and so when you know i see it all the time artists come to me and say man I've, I've got my fourth album out or my fifth album and i just got the annual bill to keep all these live and i'm gonna pull them down i'm like don't do that i'm like move them to cd baby <laughs> but uh you want to? You you can't pull your back catalog. That's the worst decision you can possibly I make. I totally agree. You you got to keep all that music live. And even as artists, I know artists get, uh, you know, we're always on to the next thing. We think, yeah. oh, that doesn't sound like me anymore. Yeah. Precious. It the word is precious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You start that. You're basically telling all the fans that liked your past music that they shouldn't like your past music anymore. <laughs> right. It's like let them keep enjoying it and let it keep <laughs> generating entry points into you right. as an artist right. and just keep releasing new music. And our model um, allows you to do that and keep it up for the long term. Because honestly, we have seen, especially in the streaming world, we have seen it happen over and over again where music that has been out there for years in some cases mm-hmm. suddenly finds an audience because it fits a certain playlist or it right. gets a sync placement or... Right. Um, it because you don't have this d- need in for it to be pulled in a in a physical world, you know. When uh, I started in music, um, you were lucky enough if the one that you had a record deal to get distribution. <laughs> Two, yeah. that distribute that deal actually turned into CDs on a shelf somewhere because for many artists, it never even mm-hmm. got to that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the trick was selling enough so the stores would keep an ample supply for at least a few months. And if you were lucky and sold well, you might have ample supply for a year, but then eventually you're only going to be, you're going to be relegated to the one or two copies of your back titles and some places it'll disappear. Yeah, and so right. we've gotten the idea of that music has an expiration date. Totally, um, yeah. But it just, and, and that those past albums were no longer useful, but that's not the reality of where we're at now. There is no shelf expiration mm-hmm. dates it's a virtual shelf digital shelf that goes on into eternity um and so therefore you should be thinking about building a catalog for the long term and um the more music you have out there the more places it can find an audience in a home and so that's how you should be thinking about your career i you're totally preaching to the choir here because this is something that i've seen artists who've said, you know, we we came up with a new sound and we want to delete everything previous and we want to start yeah, fresh. Yeah. And uh, I just, yeah, I cringe at that. I really think it's irresponsible. Uh, there may be some rare cases, but I, I really do believe in an artist building a, a back catalog and um, keeping those mile markers there um, in an honest way. Yeah, and, and, you know, two things to that. Most of the time, your fresh new sound isn't as fresh and new from your old stuff as you think. <laughs> as you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but even if it is, even if it is, that's amazing because the, your, your people want to hear where you came from. Yeah, yeah. And, and how you've grown and changed, and they want to come along for the ride. I mean, I look at artists like Radiohead, if any. Yeah. band yeah. has albums that completely sound different totally. than what they did before it's them and their fans are along for the ride in most cases i'm a big radio head mm-hmm. fan for some of their catalog yeah. some of their catalog i won't i don't care for but that's okay yeah yeah <laughs> that's 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 their prerogative of, yeah. of an artist and i understand that and i can follow along anyway yeah um but uh you know most artists are are too in their head about who they are and right. stuff. And that's right. just not how the fans perceive it. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. No, I, I, I love that idea. And it's something that I've, I've been passionate about. And when you can find a platform that lets you keep it up there forever. I mean, I remember when streaming came out, um, it, it, where, where it was so ubiquitous and, and I think it was around the time that Apple music gave out those three month, um, f- free passes. And so I was, you know, uh, just at my desk and and working away and using the streaming. And I would go into artists that I always meant to check out. I remember checking out Iron and Wine. For some reason, I had never listened to Iron and Wine. And I listened to one album. And then I just went to the next album, the next album, because of that 
the smorgasbord that that streaming allowed, I could go back and I did it with so many artists later on. That's when I realized, you know, this is a great thing. This artist may not be as proud as something they released in the late 90s, but for me, I can enjoy it all as opposed to navigating away from their artist page and, and doing something else. Yeah, and that's, you know, one of the things that we saw with the shift to streaming, having having a, such a massive catalog, we have 10 million tracks that we're representing, mm. 750,000 artists. That's a lot of storylines. It's a different storyline than what the major labels were, sure. how they approached the transition to streaming, where they were trying, you know, had a very protectionist attitude. We're protecting these, what we consider to be extremely valuable assets, which they are valuable assets. Mm-hmm. But for us, what we saw was the exact opposite that, artists were getting, uh, as a whole, our catalog was getting more streams than we originally were projecting based on the transition to streaming. And it's because of what you said. Somebody uh, can get in there and experiment because they're pu- all, all you need to do is push the play button. There's no you don't cost have to commit anymore. To, yeah, you don't have to commit to pulling out your wallet <laughs> and you don't have to commit to buying stuff. So on average, people are listening to more artists than they would in a totally CD world, yes. you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And told, so that means more experimentation. I've told the story before about the, and I, I almost miss it in a weird way of like finding new music used to be going to the record store, taking a CD up to the counter and asking if they'd open it for you. Then yes. going, putting it in the CD player and going, nah, it's not for me. And then they would take it in the back room and re-shrink wrap it. Yes. <laughs> you <Yep>. know? <laughs> So that's definitely, yeah. yeah, discovery's changed. Yeah, and, you know, now a lot of the way people are interacting with music, and this, you know, this is sort of one of the, the things people are talking about is maybe not being so great about where we are, is that people are listening by mood, they're listening by uh, activity, mm-hmm. whether mm-hmm. it's like they're working out or they're running or they're studying or coffee shop vibes or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so they're hearing a lot of music and a lot more music is getting um, used. But there are some scenarios where I've seen artists that get a lot of plays, but it doesn't translate into fans because there's definitely more passive listening going on where music is on in the background while we're doing other things. Or, you know, maybe it's a metal playlist while you're working out and you love everything you're hearing but you love just that playlist just, yeah, yeah, and you're not yeah. necessarily going down the rabbit hole of I've loving each individual too. artist. Yeah. 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 So. But you know, I ultimately, I think in a perfect harmonious um, business is that those passive listeners are still making us money. And then yes. our active listeners can, can, you know, fill in the, the other, uh, other side of the coin. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like the idea of, um, you have to understand that um, just a large number of streams doesn't uh, equal always equal the same thing. Mm. Um, we we've seen this. We started seeing this a lot uh, with Pandora quite a few years back. Um, we have a lot of solo pianists that uh, a couple in particular. One, I should I would say was making about $300,000 a year just off Pandora. Oh, wow. But uh, that's a lot of money yeah. uh, for an independent artist. Yeah. Um, and when you, and there was a lot of, there's a handful of solo piano players, not all making that amount of money, but a lot of them making, you know, five to $10,000 a month off Pandora. Right. But when you, look at these artists' websites, it's not like they're playing sold-out tours. No. You right. know, they're getting millions yeah. of streams on Pandora. Yeah. And when you think about it, it's like, that's because Pandora is perfect for the dentist office uh-huh. to put on <laughs> piano music to keep everybody calm yeah, the while they're drilling lobbies. on their teeth. Yeah. <laughs> hotel lobbies. So music's getting used in right, ways right. that drives revenue, but doesn't necessarily translate into fans. Yeah. Um, a lot of those piano players have done an excellent job of recognizing that early on by nature of the kind of music they do anyway, that yeah. sort of being their mindset and understanding and really capitalizing and building fan bases as well. But but it's one of those things where in a streaming world, it's like, oh, okay, there's lots of different things going on here. And and 
Mm -hmm. uh, lots of streams is great. The money's great, but it's it is entirely possible to have millions of streams <laughs> and no fans to yeah. show for it. <laughs> well, I suppose you could probably do like the dentist convention circuit. You could tour all of the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> orthodontic yeah. conventions. Show show data how. Uh, Patients are 10 times more relaxed listening to your album <laughs> yeah, than other right. albums. So so going back to, to choosing the platforms, and I, I did an interview month uh, years ago with Ben Hubbard, who used to be with you guys. And and I yep. love I love Ben. He he saved my ass so many times at CD Baby when he when he worked there. Um this show ultimately for labels, is there a service or a program that labels can take advantage of at CD Baby? I remember when I was talking to Ben about DistroKid and whatnot and, and, and CD Baby, when we did an interview with him at, at his new label, I I was saying that for me, what you know, the the math just actually doesn't make out to uh, come out to switch. But I love the personal connection that I get. I like the real emails. I like when people reach out to me. Ben, I would have, I would consider a friend. Uh, you know, to we're on Facebook together. Um, and when he was working at CD Baby, he was extremely helpful. Can you tell me a little bit about label services or or something that that you might have that um, uh, is is put in place to help out indie labels? Yeah, we actually have a whole uh, uh, label services team. Um, they are, we call them the creator services team. Right. Here. Okay. Uh, and there's there's I forget how many of them there are now. Uh, there's a couple here in Portland. There's a couple down in LA. Mm -hmm. um, there's one in New York and um, some around in other locations around the globe. Mm. And yeah, actually, that's that's one of the advantages. With CD Baby, that other uh, distributors don't have, and again, aren't incentivized to have because sure. that is cost for us. Um, yeah, but yeah, that that team is there to help labels uh, with priority releases, with making sure that um, one that the release goes smoothly, but two that any potential for um, features uh, based on past performance is realized or at least you know the is pitched properly to right. all the different dsps um and it's not just about playlist placements although we do have someone doing that yeah um uh we just did uh the distribution of walk off the earth for oh, canada wow. yes yep. the, their they their, la in... their label their label handled it in the united states okay. we did it for canada nice we got them a giant digital Amazon billboard and a giant digital Spotify billboard in Toronto. And I, yes, in yeah, Toronto. And right. I, and I, I believe, uh, it's like the Canadian version of times square I actually just stayed there yeah, it's, uh, um, in the fall. It's called, uh, Oh my gosh, I'm an idiot for not knowing it. It's the Eaton center, but it's called, yes. um, uh, Oh shoot. Something I'm square. So embarrassed. Yes. So, I don't know. There's a, I, I was, that's where all the I activity the, is. Yeah. Yeah. I stayed at the Bond Hotel that's right there. Okay. Uh, and the, ate at the restaurants in that shopping center. And, and, that's yeah. Right Eaton there. Center is the, the shopping center. Just down the road is Massey Hall, the acclaimed venue. And, uh, yes. Oh, if my wife was here, she works down there. She would tell me, but I, I don't remember. Uh, terrible. I thought it was somebody's name. Yes, it, it is. I got Googling square. it right now. Uh, <laughs> Nathan Phillips. No, that's not mm -hmm. Nathan Phillips. Young and Dundas Square. Right? Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I've but seen we, that. Um, yeah. So there's like there's all the massive digital uh, billboards there, just like we have in Times Square here in the U.S. <laughs> and we got Walk Off the Earth. That's great. Um, giant billboards. But the 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 funnier thing is, uh, their label in the United States could not get them anything. Wow. And they were like, what the crap? CD Baby got us these two <laughs> giant billboards and you guys didn't get us anything. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. That, yeah, that's, uh, we've been trying to tell you. That, that's you know, amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> so there's cool. opportunities yeah. like that as well, yeah. like with the right release. Um, it's not just playlists. It's, there's ad campaigns and, and stuff like that that um, all the different... Uh, DSPs are doing, especially in different regions. If you're outside of North America, or I should say outside of the U.S. and Canada, be, um, there there is extra opportunities that we can tap into because a lot of the, the DSPs are trying to connect with the local music and it makes it easier for oh, us I to see. pitch 
and get things going. Yeah, like in Latin America, we have reps all over Latin America. And, you know, in these regions, a lot of the streaming services are finding out that if they just show up with all their, you know, North American and uh, UK music catalog, that they're there's a huge dis- disconnect with the local culture. Right. And um, so they're really wanting to get artists featured in, in those regions. Oh, okay. All of it's independent. And a lot, a lot of times we're able to really get um, artists featured. Right. Yeah. So, no, that's interesting. Is there, so is there room for growth with the label services? Is Are there things that you guys could could be offering to help open more doors for indie labels and and specifically like you know small labels smaller labels in 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 less accessible genres as as walk off the earth yeah absolutely uh um and uh don't let less accessible genres you know necessarily be a barrier into your thinking because um like for example um we work with enormous amount of artists in Latin American, like regional Mexican music right. is just massive. Sure, and there's lots of yeah. opportunity there. We're the, one of the, the biggest artists right now that we're working with who uses CD Baby as an artist in Latin America is like, uh, is called El Alpha. And it's like the biggest artist ever. Huh. And uh, um, if you search it, you'll see him on the cover of everything. And he's actually streaming more than I think any artist in North America right now. He's wow. huge, massive. So in, in some of those areas, it's like we have a lot of uh, big artists that open doors for smaller artists. But um, anyway, what, what typically happens with labels is that, you know, if you are a label and you and by label, I mean, you are acting as a label. You're not just an artist calling yourself a label. And um, sure. And, but if you are a label releasing stuff, you should contact us. And usually there's a sales threshold. Right. It's not that high. But if you pass a certain sales threshold, that unlocks um, access to a more direct email. So at least you get mm. super expedited help. Yeah, and right, make sure right. your releases are all queued up and ready to go, and things are um, going properly. What? And then, as you know, there's storylines and stuff. We um, have op- You know, there's some forms you can like an online form you can fill out to like, hey, this is one that. Uh, this should be pitched and here's the reason why. And it's similar to how, like if you're in Spotify for artists um, and uh, you know, you have a new release queued up and it's over before, you know, at least seven days in advance that it, it unlocks this playlist pitching tool. A lot of that mm-hmm. information that they ask is similar to what we ask for. Like what are the storylines? What's yes, past sales right. history? Yeah. What are, what are the edit, you know, the plans for marketing this? So um, we can, you know, help partner with you and and make some things happen. And you know, it's not something that is guaranteed, but it's definitely something that is a growing department and uh, is there. That we just we're trying to figure out how to do a a better job of making it known publicly without it sounding like a promise to all our artists. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally know what you mean. And and I mean, I love, I really love your justification for that 9% cut because it is, it is kind of scary. I mean, artists, artists are so terrified that people are going to own them and, and, you know, they're going to have, have that Taylor Swift story where they don't own anything or whatnot. But I, I, your justification of it, I really do like because um, you know, I remember when I was releasing something a couple months ago, I received a, uh, an email from a rep from CD Baby, and and he had some ideas for pitching it to certain playlists, and I was like, oh, that's kind of sweet. Like, why? Like, what's in it for you? And then I and then I kind of put two and two together. I was like, oh, this they want their artists to succeed, and 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 so it is. It felt nice to have like somebody on your team, and I and I really liked that. That was a cool thing. Yeah. We're a partner in their success. I have, I have heard other distributors refer to their artists as cost centers, <laughs> cost centers that, that need to be managed in oh, their business because I see. they, the more they release, the more it drives up their costs, and they don't get anything for it. Right. And I, and I'm not even making that up. Yeah. Uh, as yeah. far as that, having heard that, and to me, that was just like having worked at CD Baby for 14 years and been an artist before and still while being here and that's just like the idea of looking at artists that way to me was just like 
I, I wouldn't want to work for a company that views its artists that way. Sure. I'm an artist. I want it to be a, a relationship where we're both excited and we both have, uh, we both benefit yeah. because I've also, I've also been in that band where someone's like, Oh, I'll do some management stuff for you and I'll just make next to nothing. And, and the reliability or actually totally. feeling like, you have a professional relationship. It's just not there. Yeah, totally. Um, well, yeah. And I mean, listen, this isn't a paid post or anything for me. I really do <laughs> love, I, I love, and I don't care who, what other people use. And I'm sure I know there's a lot of happy artists doing their own thing elsewhere, but I, I love CD baby and I've been with them for a long time. And, and the, you know, just that reaching out and feeling comfortable and i had i would always have like pre-release anxiety and like i'd stay up till midnight to make sure everything was in order and back in the day and i mean i have i have reps now with creator services but back with ben i would message him you know luckily you guys are on four hours later in the day for me and i would be like is everything okay is everything looking all right um and i just think you need that you know and and i've always yeah. appreciated that yeah, well, thank you. We we appreciate you saying that. And and you know what? Ultimately, and I've said this from the beginning when when I started at CD Baby fourteen years ago, my job was to answer the phone and talk to artists and just help them. And if if somebody was like, you know what, it's for my career, this other situation is better. Then go do that. Sure. You know, we want totally. ultimately. I want yeah. I want the artists to to feel fulfilled in their arts and feel supported. And um and if if they're feeling that a different direction is right for them. Fine. Yeah. Go do that. Be <laughs> yeah. fulfilled. Do what you feel is right. Yeah. But when when uh, you need us, we'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's like a big worry that the middle class mu musicians are disappearing, that you're either Drake or you're obsolete. Is is that your belief or do you see a space for minimum wage musicians? I honestly think the Drakes are disappearing. I think okay. that's the, the okay. real class that's really going. I mean, you think about it. When you think about what's happening, uh, the Super Bowl is about to happen. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know when people will hear this. The Super After Bowl will probably Super be Bowl. over. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but you think about every year, it's getting harder and harder for them to figure out who should play the halftime show. Right. And it's because that superstar, iconic artist class just doesn't exist. Sure. Like it used to. Yeah, well, you're right. Where, They're the same as they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You think, you think uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago when you think, who's big enough to play the Super Bowl and command a worldwide stage like that? And you could come up with a list of like 10, 15 artists. Now it's like, gee, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, you know I, so I think what's really happened, and you see this in the numbers, is that the segment of independent music uh, the, of the market is growing. Um, or I think the last number I saw was that it's making up 30%, a uh, 35% of consumption and continues to grow. And, um, you know, the, it, that's major label content losing out to independence. And so I think that segment is continuing to grow. That doesn't mean that it, all the problems are solved and everything's easy. Any artistic career is not easy. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Any, because it, at the end of the day, there comes this unpredictable, um, you know, some stuff connects and sometimes it doesn't. You, mm -hmm. And you can have an amazing artist that for whatever reason people aren't connecting with. Um, and, uh, or you can have an artist that every, it just happens for. And uh, so... I think, you know, there's there's definitely an expansion of artists who are seeing uh, significant revenue from their music, whether or not it's their full-time career, you know, that's, I think that's the other thing that's sort of a misnomer with how people talk about artist revenue is that the thing is that there's so many people participating in the industry now that are amazing artists that they've never wanted it to be their full-time career. They're perfectly happy with their day job being right. a, a teacher, a yeah, computer scientist, uh, uh, you know, whatever. And that this is their creative outlet and they do an amazing job at it. And now they're making some money from it um, and able to reach people around the world. And that just wasn't possible before. So there's all sorts of storylines within the numbers of like, 
what are we really talking about as far as the middle class musician? I see. Um, but in reality, what we see is that, you know, uh, it continues to expand and more music is finding a voice. And, um, and to me, I see, you know, the, the superstars scene sure. downward sure. compression on, yeah, yeah. on the market is, is, as us indies, uh, allow, uh, you know, make it more interesting for the listener. There, there are some great stories where I look at, I look at some guys who I know who are, who are in my community and, and they have, for some reason, they just so happen to write the, the peaceful ambient folk music songs that, that catch on with a lot of playlists and, and they've got, you know, hundred thousand listeners or more. And I know they're, they're making a living or at least the same living that they would be at working at Starbucks. And I, I, I find such joy in that. That's so exciting. Or seeing that from a, um, a Spanish guitarist who, who's, who's just covering songs, the same type of career. I think that's so beautiful. Yeah. And I think also, uh, the world is bigger than Western music, and we're seeing that mm -hmm. as well. That, That's a good point. That, yeah. mm -hmm. that there's lots of regions that have very rich musical histories that are, um, and cultures that are, are starting to bubble up to the surface, and people finding enjoyment in other cultural music experiences than just um, rock and roll. It's even so, though I love the rock and roll. Though, yeah, right. So I want to ask you if this is, is this is getting better. There's a lot of people who criticize the the royalty rate. Many years ago, I thought I read, I thought I'd heard that Spotify said that when they get more subscriptions, then they can pay a higher streaming royalty. I don't know if that was true or if I heard that right. I, at the same time, I, I can't see how that works because raising their royalty rate would be raising their business costs and and what business would do that. Like, is the royalty rate going to get bigger? Are there going to be, is it going to be more subscribers? Uh, is there positivity in the future in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think we're still at the beginnings of a whole paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it may turn out that Spotify is the, is the MySpace of the streaming world. <laughs> okay, yeah, true. <laughs> uh, because they, you're right, they do have a problem. They're... Their uh, their biggest expense is paying royalties, and so the more people stream music, uh, <laughs> the bigger their expense yeah, gets. Yeah, it's weird. It's so weird. So for them, their biggest, you know, it works out better for artists if they get everyone in the world to subscribe and then not, not listen, listen to as much music. Yeah, like a gym which membership. Is, yeah, <laughs> which is counterintuitive. Yeah. But, um, so what... What I've been seeing is that, you know, the other services like Apple Music that pays more and Amazon, um, I think some of those are, are poised better for long-term success. They've been slow to develop. I know Amazon's making some big strides and going to launch an artist portal. Oh, great. Um, and that and we're going to be partnering with them on that. Um, That's awesome. I'm excited about them because... Amazon's not trying to, you know, they make money from other things. You're and right. so the idea of paying out more royalties seems like a, a more of a promising future there mm. than uh, maybe with Spotify. Um, but also the interesting thing is I just, you know, asked our fans, Small Town Poets, my band, what, uh, what service are they listening to our music on? And I said like... Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, or other, or are you still listening to MP3s and CDs? And I was surprised at how many of our fans said they were listening on Amazon. Um, oh, and when okay. we were promoting one of our recent releases, you know, we had one of those pages where it has links to all the services. Yeah. And Amazon was clicked. It was the number three link behind uh, Spotify and the iTunes store. Wow. <laughs> Not even Apple Music. Wow. And so I'm like, I'm like, there's more people out there listening to on Amazon and other services than we give them credit for. Spotify really proved the streaming ecosystem and how music can be used in a different way that can really push listenership forward. Sure. But they haven't cornered the market. Yeah, sure. And when, when some of these other platforms, I know Amazon is admittedly will say, yeah, we just haven't engaged like we should and now we're we've been told to go, uh, full on. Great. And so that's, that's why I know they, they've got some really cool tools coming 
and like the you know data from how many people are accessing your music from Alexa, right, um, right, right, and things like that that are changing how people interact with music again. No. Um, so it's, yeah, so there's some of that stuff that that's coming that I think some of those other services that pay out more will start attracting more and more um, of the listenership, which will drive more revenue. And, and I had heard somewhere and, and tell me if this is true, would it then be true that it's possibly easier to reach out to editorial people from platforms that aren't as popular or aren't as um, uh, targeted as Spotify? I mean, right now the dream is to get on those coffee house playlists on Spotify, but are people pursuing editorial staff at title just as much? And, and how do you do that? Um, well, that, that's a good question. And actually, yes, it is easier at other companies that aren't, uh, that, that aren't, you know, Spotify. Spotify. <laughs> and, and, and especially, you know, if you're not in the United States, but right. Yes. And, um, that's why, uh, you know, that walk off the earth billboard, the one that the, the gigantic one, we yeah. got them was an Amazon music billboard. Oh. So, uh, they're getting this gigantic Amazon billboard. Um, they had it, you know, for the week of their release and it's promoting them. And it was a much easier get than, you know, we, we also got them a Spotify one, but it was much smaller. I see. Uh, still, still quite large, but <laughs> you've never gotten me but a the, Spotify. But the Amazon, the Amazon one, if you, in that place in Canada, it was the building where the billboard actually wraps around the corner. Yeah, yeah, right. And it's right, like, right. it's, um, so yes, there are opportunities. And that's when we're working with a label services crew, when they're working with um, labels, it's like, let's get beyond thinking about just the Spotify world because an Apple Music ba uh, opportunity or Amazon opportunity that's going to plaster your face on a billboard in Times Square, <laughs> that's still your artist's face on a billboard yeah, in sure. Times Square. People are going to go listen where they listen. Yeah. Um, and so getting beyond some of those, that thinking, and especially, you know, depending on where you're at, you know, Deezer is a popular streaming service in France. It's where oh, they're okay. based. Interesting, um, yeah. Um, and we just uh, are about to launch with uh, Boom Play, which covers Africa. And hmm. so it's like if you're in a different region or have an opportunity to tap into a different region, uh, the world is bigger than what we think in uh, America. There's lots of yeah, services in yeah. in India and, and China and Japan that we just don't have here because you can't have it. Um, and can, and can American labels and artists do anything to promote to those people and to acknowledge the, those services and, and submit to them? Yes, uh, there are opportunities for those. Um, and it just depends also on, on that end, if they have an editorial staff I see. And, and opportunities there, but yes, there are other opportunities that, for those services. Um, it just depends where and which ones, because, sure, sure. you know, a lot of them are pretty new and are still figuring out the whole editorial piece. I want to ask you a question as we're talking about streaming. This is something that I've always um, been curious about. And you brought up Radiohead earlier, and I know that you have, um, you have records that you released with your band back in the nineties. And, and I, I, when I was thinking about streaming a few years ago, I was driving in the car and I was listening to my copy of kid a, which I bought on CD the, the day it came out in 2000, the fall of 2000. And I, I was thinking, man, I've listened to the CD now for 20 years over and over and Radiohead only got paid one time versus had I been streaming that for the next 20 years and the last 20 years, what is your opinion now that you've released music, knowing that today, right now, somebody is listening to one of your CDs from the 90s and you're not getting any money from it? Well, that's funny you ask that because when I posted that on our Facebook page asking people what how they're listening, I was frustrated with how many people said MP3s and CDs. <laughs> yeah. because it's, like, it's over, man. It's, a lot of them are like, I'm going to go get that CD right now. I'm like, no, 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 no. no. Put that CD away. Go stream it somewhere because I'll make some more money. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it, that, is, that is the thing. It's like um, the streaming world, uh, the biggest difference is it is no longer a buying economy. It is a listening economy. 
And if you make music that people want to listen to over and over again, you will do just fine. If you are banking on the fact that you have one song that people kind of like and they're forced to go buy a 10-song piece of plastic and you make uh, $15 off of that and they really only liked one song, uh, that's, that's going to be a tough road. Mm. And that's what a lot of people got used to. Um, and, but the, the thing is you got to focus on making music that people want to listen to over and over again and cultivating that relationship with the fans. And ultimately, if you are an artist, you should love that because then it's all about the music right. and less about the sales pitch. It's like, right. just make music people want to listen to. That's beautiful. And just yeah. ask them to push the play button. And it's easy to push the play button and it doesn't cost them anything. You're not asking them to pull out their wallet and make some sort of lifelong commitment to you. And that's, and you, you know, that's circling back to what we talked about at the beginning. And, and I'm a huge proponent of artists and labels being prolific. And when we were talking about people who let their music expire or, or intentionally pull it off platforms, I personally, and I want your opinion, I treat my Spotify artist page like it's a social media page. I try to upload demos and Christmas tunes and new singles and remixes as often as possible. Do you have thoughts on this versus that, you know, what we're talking about, the traditional album cycle? Yeah, I mean, the, the traditional album cycle is is uh, is really starting to, you know, go away in the sense that... Um, you know, like I talked about earlier, that if you didn't have all these sales happen the first week your music was out, the store would pull it off the shelves sure. and, and then yeah, they'd send over. it back to the label. Hmm. That doesn't matter anymore. And there's always opportunity to keep promoting a last, uh, a, a, a previous release. Um, and thinking about, like I said, a whole catalog viewpoint of like going back, you know what, this song we released 10 years ago, that'll be perfect for this acoustic playlist. I'm going to go pitch it to that acoustic playlist right. and see if there's an opportunity for it. And we're seeing that kind of thing happen all the time where music, all of a sudden that we saw, like there's this one artist that comes to mind. He's actually Canadian. I won't say his name because he may, I don't know. He may listen to the podcast, Okay, but I saw he had a massive spike and like all of a sudden was just making tons of money off this song. I'm like, what happened? And I looked in his account and for two years, this album had been out and barely made a penny. And then he got added to a, a coffee shop playlist, an official Spotify coffee shop playlist randomly wow. two years later, and the song blew up. And wow. so the traditional album cycle would would have long yeah. crashed oh, for that sure. album, said it's done, there's no life in it, it has for no sure. audience, we're moving on. And so, yes, we're seeing that. We're also seeing like the cycle change where a lot of artists are setting up a release with a couple singles that helps build activity about around new music. It gets people following the artist. It tells the algorithm that there's activity around this artist. Hmm. And then when the full album comes out that, uh, it, you know, it pushes to all those people, uh, release radar and discover weekly and, um, and you know, all the other stuff that can happen automatically just because the algorithm's seen activity around an artist. So we're seeing a lot of people set up their album releases with a single or two. And sure. that's across the board. Indies, we're doing it first, I will say. But the major labels are doing it constantly now. Right, um, right. In fact, I Pearl Jam just did that this past Friday. They've got a new song, but there's an album coming out. But this is the song that'll be out to sort of set the stage for the album release. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Man, this is so. This is all so helpful, and I know our listeners are are going to be uh, digging this up. I wrote down not a buying economy, a listening economy. That's really inspiring, and I want to kind of dig into that on my own. Um, but thank you so much for doing this, Kevin. It's it's been a lot of fun to chat with you. Absolutely, and and uh, hopefully, uh, Small Town Post will get to play up in Canada again. Yes, <laughs> I know. Soon. I've been waiting at that fairground <laughs> since I was fourteen years old. Uh, um, what's going on with? I know you know you have the the Godfather of podcasts in the, in the indie music genre, the DIY Musicians Podcast. What's going on with that? And uh, what's going on with CD Baby? Are there, are there things you're looking forward to? Excited about this year? Um. Well, uh, we continue to roll. We've got, uh, I think. 247 episodes live. Wow. Yeah, we've been podcasting since 2007. And I've got a couple wow. in the can. One with uh, uh, the next one coming up is going to be with uh, uh, Canadian company, Banzoogle. I okay. interviewed, Dave, interviewed Dave Cool from cool. Banzoogle. And 
And uh, yeah, but we just, there's the industry keeps changing and, you know, and the way artists can reach audiences and capitalize that are, are changing. We're going to be doing a big episode about TikTok. We just announced TikTok distribution today. Interesting. Um, Interesting. So that was big news for us. I just and, downloaded uh, that last night. I must have seen that ad or must have seen that it came up in, in, in CD Baby that it was one that you guys were pushing to them because I was like, I got to download this. This I need to f- find out about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's it's not... it It's... Uh, to be determined how long TikTok will be around, <laughs> but people are excited about it now, and it all—it actually does very much center around the usage of music and fans interacting with music. Sure. So, I people are excited about it, um, and it just points to how things have changed. Where, uh, you know, ten years ago, the the major labels would have been horrified that we're doing something that allows fans to include music and interact with it the way they want to yeah, um, where right. now that's that's where we're at it becomes more experiential for interest for the uh the fan community it's so fascinating well thanks so much for doing this it's been yep. great to talk yep. to you and thank you all for listening you can check out cd baby on your own to see if they're right for your distribution needs and you can check them out at cdbaby.com you can also email them their support line they're very quick to get back to emails and they're very helpful Uh, or at least I have found that to be true. Thank you so much for listening. If you're at that stage where you're um, contemplating things like um, distributors uh, and and distribution and marketing and and releasing singles and, and whatnot, I'm in the process of developing a couple more resources for our listeners. But right now, We have some resources at otherrecordlabels.com, including our free guide, which you can download right now at otherrecordlabels.com. Thanks for listening.